You might think toxic relationships are limited to just a celebrity crowd, but the drama actually extends far beyond the red carpet. In this video, we are about to uncover six of the most shocking and surprising toxic relationships between celebrities and prominent literary figures. Whether you're enjoying a snack, behind the wheel, or just plain curious about the juicy interpersonal stories behind classic books of literature, you want to stick around until the end. The six couples relationship is guaranteed to leave you utterly speechless. You won't believe what went down between these two luminaries. The tragic love affair of Walter Benjamin and Asia Lasis. The relation between the famous German theorist Walter Benjamin and Asia Lacy's, a journalist from Moscow, was also a painful drama. Lacy's was no ordinary woman. She was a Latvian theater director, an ardent communist activist who exerted a profound influence over Benjamin's pioneering Marxist-influenced writings. Their relationship was both personal and professional. The pair first met in 1924 when Lacey's was directing productions in the German city of Capri. Benjamin fell hopelessly, unrequitedly in love, becoming infatuated with her for over a decade. He even traveled to Moscow in a desperate attempt to win her affections, resulting in his book Moscow Memoirs. But alas, Lacey's rebuffed Benjamin's advances shattering his heart. This tragic rejection may have even contributed to Benjamin's ultimate demise. He took his own life while fleeing the Nazis. His brilliant mind and groundbreaking ideas tragically extinguished. So Benjamin and Lacey's shared an undeniable connection, they were never able to make a life together. Lacey's remained more steadily involved with another man, the German theater director Bernard Ray, whom she married. Benjamin and Lacey's were separated by both geography and the limits of Lacey's romantic commitments. The better sweet story of this ill-fated pairing is a poignant testament to the power of intellectual passion and the devastating pain of love lost. The relationship between Vladimir Mayakovsky and Lilia Brick is considered one of the great romantic dramas of world literature. Their attempt a new kind of coexistence, a brave attempt to create a new relationship of friendship and love. This relationship continued up to the moment of Mayakovsky's suicide. It was a tumultuous relationship, full of ups and downs, and later Lilia Brick wrote about it. Lilia Breck was born in Moscow in 1891, and Osip Breck was born in Moscow in 1888. Lilia was 14 years old and Osip was 17 when they fell in love. They both studied at the same school, and Osip was Lilia's classmate. Lilia and Osip worked together in political activities, but when Lilia went to Germany with her mother and sister, the separation caused Osip's love to fade. Shocking Lilia, after they returned, they met each other again, but there was no relationship between them until the series reconnected five years later, leading to their marriage. Maya Kowalski was a poet whom Lilia had seen around and heard reciting his poetry at a party. But there was no relationship between them until Lilia's father got cancer and Lilia went to Moscow. In this city, Lilia and Maya Kowalski met each other closely and fell in love. Osip Brick knew about this relationship and did not interfere until one day, when all three of them officially confessed their love for each other and announced this arrangement. From that day on, all three of them lived in a common house, which belonged to Mayakovsky and Osip. The relationship continued until the end of Mayakovsky's love, although at times he was withdrawn and rarely inclined towards another person. Mayakovsky remained infatuated with Lilia. This relationship continued until Mayakovsky's suicide with its ups and downs and later Lilia Brick wrote about it in the book Lilia and Mayakovsky by Benjamin Nasers. Now let me tell you about the relationship between Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes, two celebrated poets. 
I wish their relationship had been as beautiful and joyful as their faces. Sylvia Plath was a celebrated American poet and novelist, widely regarded as one of the most influential literary voices of the 20th century. Ted Hughes was a renowned and influential British poet celebrated for his bold imaginative work that drew inspiration from nature, mythology, and the human psyche. Their relationship was a complex one, marked by challenges. Sylvia Plath wrote in letters about the difficulties in their marriage. She wrote in letters to a psychotherapist about domestic violence and beatings she received from Ted Hughes. Ted Hughes beat Sylvia two days before the abortion of his baby and told her clearly that he wished her to die. Sylvia Plath eventually committed suicide in a painful way. Her death was a devastating loss for the literary world. I made an interesting video about Sylvia Plath's biography and her relationship with Ted Hughes, including their deaths. However, YouTube limited my video about dear Sylvia and her suicide, claiming the video encourages suicide. What does her life and suicide have to do with me? I don't know. Anyway, I will provide you the link to the video in the description. Zelda Fitzgerald and Escott Fitzgerald The Fitzgeralds were one of the most celebrated artist couples in the world of nearly a century, and their lives became the basis for writing stories and making many films. They had a passionate yet tragic love life. It is said that Zelda Fitzgerald was not only a beautiful ballerina, but she is also considered a good solitaire. However, the twisted and toxic relationship she had with Scott Fitzgerald ultimately brought her to a bitter end. Most of us know Scott Fitzgerald through his acclaimed work The Great Gatsby, while Zelda is less widely known. Fans of movies and TV series may remember the depiction of their relationship in films like Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris or Genius, as well as the TV series The Vampire Diaries. As Scott Fitzgerald himself once wrote, Zelda and I sometimes fight for four days, a fight that usually starts from a night party, yet we still love each other terribly and are the only happy married couple I know. The happiest things in my life are Zelda and the hope that my book will turn out to be something wonderful. I want to be admired again. Some biographers, literary critics, and even contemporary writers and friends of the Fitzgeralds considered Zelda an obstacle to its cut's literary progress. The most vocal of this was Ernest Hemingway, who was once an admirer of Fitzgerald's work. In 1928, Hemingway wrote to his friend Max Perkins, saying, 90% of his Scott's misfortunes are caused by Zelda. Sometimes, I think to myself, if he hadn't married someone who made him waste everything, wouldn't he have been the best writer of our time? Ultimately, Scott Fitzgerald left Zelda and was forced to accept an offer from a Hollywood company to work in screenwriting in order to manage his life. Scott went to Hollywood to study screenwriting, where he met Sheila Graham. A few years later, he suffered a heart attack and collapsed at the age of 44, in relative anonymity and poverty. Sheila, who was very similar to Zelda and had entered Fitzgerald's life in recent years, was by his side when he died. Prior to his death, Zelda had been admitted to a mental asylum, where she later died in a fire at the asylum as a result of her loneliness. The strange and complicated relationship between Friedrich Nietzsche and Lou Salami. The relationship between Friedrich Nietzsche and Lou Salami had one of the bitterest endings. As the beginning of their acquaintance, Nietzsche wrote, I have not been this lucky in a long time. Lou Salami was a seductive young woman. Recognizing this seduction requires a small amount of masculine elegance in order to reveal the rare power of magic behind the images of that Petersburg noble woman. In the depths of those piercing and driving looks and thus perhaps the secret of Nietzsche's fascinating will also be revealed. Despite his aesthetic life, 
Nietzsche instinctively discovered this extraordinary power and perhaps it was this mesmerizing quality that led him, even after many challenges, to describe Salome to Lady Malvida von Meissenbach as This girl has a stronger beyond of friendship with me than anything found on earth. It has been a long time since luck has turned to me like this. I hope I have found my true student. And if my life is not enough, Lou will continue my way and my thinking. Lou will continue my way and my thinking. However, Nietzsche's jealous sister, Elizabeth, hates Lou Salami, viewing her as a poisonous vermin who must be exterminated. At the same time, Nietzsche asks himself two questions. Is it possible that Lou is an angel who does not understand? Could I be a stupid ass? Nietzsche broke off his relationship with Lou Salome in December 1882. In an unsigned letter to her, Nietzsche called Salome an ugly depongy monkey and an ominous phenomenon. Ernest Hemingway's third wife was Martha Gellhorn, a prominent journalist whose accounts of World War II survived. The remaining photos of this couple always showed them happily in each other's arms. But in Martha's discovered diary, it is revealed that Hemingway beat her at least twice and once again he deliberately crashed his car into a tree with the intention of killing her. In 1936, Gellhorn spent Christmas with her mother Edna and younger brother Alfred in Key West, Florida. Her father had died in the spring of the same year. Her second book, Problems I Saw, including four long stories based on her experiences traveling throughout America during the economic recession, had just been published and received a warm welcome from audiences and critics. She had also just ended her four-year relationship with Bertrand Dujival, a famous French journalist and economics. At that time, Glowhorn was 28 years old. One night, she went to a cafe called Slappy Joe with her mother and brother. In a corner of the cafe, Glowhorn noticed Hemingway, who in her words, was a big, dirty man in dirty clothes. Hemingway was 37 years old at the time and had three children from his second marriage. The second wife of the author of The Old Man and the Sea, was Pauline, a journalist who wrote for Walk and Vanity Fair. The name of Hemingway's first wife was Hadley. Hemingway opened the conversation with Gellhorn. Unlike many women of that time, Gellhorn was self-reliant, accomplished, independent and intelligent, but not so intelligent as to scare Hemingway. James Joyce described Hemingway as a strong as a buffalo, where he wrote, favorable to arms and he is considered by many to be one of the best writers of his time. Hemingway fell in love with Gellhorn during his four business trips to Spain. But Gellhorn, as can be seen as her letters to her mother, did not have the same feelings for Hemingway until after the defeat of the Republicans. One night when Hemingway was drunk, Gellhorn got into Hemingway's beloved Lincoln Continental and after the author of The Old Man and the Sea slapped her. He crashed the car into a tree in an attempt to kill Gellhorn. From then on, the fights between these two intensified over every issue, until one day, having been announced that he had become a reporter for Colliers, which means Gellhorn's dismissal from this magazine. I will definitely talk more about the lives and relationships of these two couples in the next videos, so stay tuned. Bye!